to my, we've got the drive hooked up, need to get to the file. So, okay, here. Or it's in the drive. <coughs> should show up under, under the, the there, in, in the folder there. There would know. Hold on, guys. We're just getting situated. Uh, Bible study ran a few minutes long. So it should have popped up. Where's the drive? So take it out and put it back in. It's not going to download. And then it'll pop up. Why isn't it opening these? It's telling you right here. <laughs> This is so awesome to see back in March. You should be only see the phone for buildings of Jeremy Jones for two months. And now it's like, just but see. When you plug it in, and you can open that, you can take it to the job. It's like, so for some, 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 some reason, it doesn't come. I can't even tell you. It was, it was depressing back then. It was like, yeah. Well, well like, uh, what's that movie, 2001, when the guy's like alone on the space station? <laughs> <laughs> so it was like that. <laughs> Well, I can play because sometimes, I, like Jeremy you, would come well, back and I would come in and sign them. And so sometimes, if I missed him, I got to know who to talk to. We need the, we need the oh, I can start talking. Um, we're getting um, getting set up here. Uh, I need to get Tasha back. Let me go get her. Yeah. yeah. The um, USB drive won't open up for the actual presentation. In the meantime, I am Ed Robertson. Uh, my company is Home Team Inspection Service. Do a lot of work with you guys over the years. Today, we're going to do first this uh, home inspection. Uh, we, we call it an orientation class, but I've had it for ages, but I've had 30 year agents sit in the room and say, This is really good for everyone. If I stand further Oops. away, yeah, you I can okay? take your mask off. Here, let's, let's test. I can't hear you. Talk again. Um, can you guys hear that? As. Uh, as we go through this, I've had 30 year agents say that this is a good class for everyone. This is not going to take you through step by step of the inspection. This is going to talk about the inspection process, why it is the way it is. We're going to talk about some of the state uh, regulatory requirements for home inspectors, things we have to do, as well as some things that home inspectors don't have to do. And it's important for agents to understand that, which is why I shared with you this is the standards of practice document out of the state okay. licensure law you can go on when we do this i'm going to show you a url to this website you can go on here and you can see the whole law the legislation the administrative code and the standards of practice we're going to talk about this a little bit in the context of the class but while they're pulling that up maybe just direct you to um definitions and then there's a generic a general list of, of, of exclusions it's pretty good for agents to be familiar with what's not traditionally part of a home inspection scope now home inspector is free to go beyond that anywhere they want to there are some caveats there primarily on the legal side uh, we get warned by insurance companies 
don't go beyond the scope because if you go beyond it here, it's hard to defend why you didn't do something over there. So it's inspectors make choices. They make they make value judgments every day on inspections. But there's a list of general exclusions, and then you've got 10 systems. We're going to outline those 10 systems. But in here, there's 10 systems starting with structural components. Each of those systems is laid out the same too. It's going to talk about what a home inspector shall inspect as part of that system, and then list some things, and then it's going to dictate what a home inspector shall describe. Um, there are things that we're required to describe in, a, in an inspection report that have nothing to do with a defect or safety issue. It's just important for your client to understand what's in that house. What are the plumbing materials? Uh, talking about the water heater, talking about the appliances, talking about the siding material, the roofing material, those sorts of things. Even if there's nothing wrong with them, the state of North Carolina wants the client to know what's in that home. Um, that didn't look good. I guess we still got some technical difficulties, so I'll, I'll do everything I can in the meantime. Um, so each of these systems is broken down the same, and it also, each individual system talks about some things that are excluded that a home inspector doesn't have to do in that particular system. So it's important to know what a home inspector does do and has to do, but it's almost equally important to understand what's not part of that home inspector. Uh, low voltage wiring, Cat 5 wiring, your old doorbell wiring, telephone wiring, those sorts of things. Those are not part of a, a home inspection as an example. Fences, not part of the home inspection. Uh, an inspector is free to report on them. And um, I would have spent, if I were going to a home that had a pool in the backyard and I see anything about the fences and gates that I know are not safe for a pool environment, I'm going to report that even though I'm not responsible for the fences. I'm not responsible for the pool. I'm going to take the extra step of, of informing uh, your client about those things. Um, uh, like I said, each of these then has its individual uh, section of exclusions related to that. So I share this every time I do this class because it's, I think it's just a good idea for agents to be more familiar with this document that really dictates what home inspectors do. Um, in North Carolina, there is a what's considered um, a, a statement of limitation, uh, uh, the way the law looks at it. it. It makes much more sense when you're feeding the slides. But uh, there's a legal presumption that we did do something in that scope unless we tell you that we didn't or we couldn't. For instance, if we go into an old house and there's about a 10 inch crawl space or, or half of it's too low to get in. We can't get into everything. That's okay. We couldn't do it, but we need to tell you we didn't do it or we're responsible for whatever might be found under there later. It's okay for us to not perform something we couldn't perform, maybe because we physically couldn't, or maybe because the client says, hey, we're replacing the roof anyway. I don't care what you see up there. I'm not worried about it. And we might say the roof, the roof wasn't. Uh, uh, inspected, then we're not going to be responsible for anything uh, on that later. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, we are responsible for it. Another ex example, and, and where it's important for uh, your client, Sharon, I can either hook up my computer or I can, they've got a, a flash drive. What's the one that it is? Uh, still inside latest rev presentations, you open it up, <coughs> and then the realtor home inspection. So okay. that right there. All right. All right, we'll be there in a minute. Um, we go into a house, garage is full of stuff. Maybe it was full of stuff anyway, but maybe the stager had a boom, everything they didn't want in the house out there. We open the garage door, and it's going to take two guys 30 minutes to move all the stuff to get to the water heater. We're not getting the water heater on there. We're going to take a picture of it, we're going to call it a limitation, and we're going to say, Hey, you have somebody move all this stuff. Now, a good inspector will make a reasonable effort to get something done. Uh, if I go in there and there's a, you know, a, a not unreasonable amount of stuff to move, I want to get that water heater. I want to get that electrical panel. I want to get that crawl space. I want to do the best job I can do and can get away. Um, <clears throat> but if it's just not reasonable, home inspector's not going to do that. He's not required by the state to move anything. So if he went in there and there's a 
uh, you know, uh, a couch in front of, um, you know, we couldn't get to an outlet or you couldn't get to the AC uh, uh, return plenum. We don't have to move the caps. Now, a reasonable inspector is going to do a little something. But if I go <clears throat> into a house, the other thing to understand in North Carolina home inspections, there's two areas where um, <clears throat> inspectors are directed by the state to test a uh, representative sample, and that's windows and outlets. And what's representative is considered one in each room. So a home inspector only has to operate one window. He only has to test one outlet, and he satisfies the scope for his for his licensure requirements. Now again, if I go in there, if I can get to it, I'm going to test it because the one I didn't test is the one that, that you're going to have a problem with. Now I'm going to say that's okay. I did this one. I'm covered. But still, if I can get to it, why wouldn't I do as thorough a job as I could? Um, so some things like that. Um, there was another example I was thinking of while we're waiting here. That uh, um, windows outlets. But if we go in and somebody's got, you know, there's outlets and a window in the corner, and they've got a table, they've got a lamp, they've got all their tchotchkes and, and, and junk there. We're probably not doing that window, and we're probably not doing that outlet. We're not going to break something or risk breaking something and having to pay for it to get that one window or that out. It's just not, not reasonable, but we're going to make a reasonable effort to get all those things done. Um, one of the things too is, and, and you'll see this when we walk through this afternoon, when you walk through a home and, and the, the purpose of this class, and I've got additional, the purpose of these is to help an, an agent understand what they need to know in these things. What do you need to know during a home inspection? Why is a home inspector doing this and, and not doing that? Um, in those 10 systems, another example might be uh, two of these systems require a home inspector to probe where rotted wood or rotted materials is suspected. That's the structural system and the exterior system. Every now and then, we'll get a complaint back because you know, we went in and we stabbed holes in their siding, or we did this or we did that. Well, you can't stab a hole in good siding. You can't stick a screwdriver in good wood. But we're required by the state to probe, that's their word, you'll see it in here. Um, in fact, it's in, it's in structural and exterior. Um, the home inspector shall probe structural components where deterioration is suspected. So if I go in there and that's, uh, you know, and when I walk up and see it, where it's suspected, I suspect it based on what I see. You walk up to a piece of trim at the base of the door, you can see, you know, it may be painted, it may be perfectly white, but you can see behind that paint that wood is rippled or, or sunken in or something. I'm going to probe it with a screwdriver. Well, I've just stabbed a hole in it. Well, that's okay. It was already damaged. I've just exposed the damage that was already there. The same thing in the exterior section, which would be your siding, your trim, all of those things, or any structural components. But we're in a uh, floor structure under the house, and there's there's really two ways that that wood can be consumed. The one is by wood destroying insects. The other is by fungus. Fungus will do the same thing to wood that uh, that termites will do. It just goes in and digest the cellulose and leave you a hollow frame of wood. So if you ever see uh, a, a floor joist and you look at the bottom of that joist and it's cupped, that's because the cellulose is all gone out of it. I can put a screwdriver through that just as if termites had, had consumed it. So, uh, I'm, you know, in some of those, if they're severe enough, I can put a screwdriver all the way through it. In other words, that member is just not structurally sound. It's no good. And we find it. We find uh, houses um, that have, were built in 1982 and never had a vapor barrier. And the conditions under it, some spots of the ground are just wet and some are just dry. I had a house 1982 last week that uh, was, it was built in 1982. It's never had a uh, vapor barrier. The ground was bone dry and the wood was 13, 14% wood moisture. That's great. That's almost as good as a sealed crawl space. 
extremely lucky because for all of those years, they've never had a vapor barrier under there. Had houses similar to that, and the whole floor structure needed to be replaced because it was either fraud or consumed by fungus. So a lot of it depends on what's the piece of ground your house is sitting on. It depends for moisture and for radon. Uh, I've got a radon class, I've got an HTAC class for agents. You, some of you may have sat in them. We've been doing them on Zoom. We used to do them in here. We've been doing them on Zoom. This is the first live thing we've done, I think, back in here since uh, since COVID started. So that's, that's a, a, a mark of, of uh, progress. And also, what a perfect day to go on a field trip. So looking forward to that. <clears throat> but um, thinking of radon, I can take you to parts of Durham where I can find high radon here, throw a rock over here, and it's no radon, or vice versa. Um, we get into areas of, of the triangle that, um, you know, I, I say if you're in the eastern half of the triangle, you better not pass on the radon test. You really shouldn't pass on anywhere in, in the triangle. We, we find it everywhere from Young Bull to Fuquay. And we even have had highs in Chapel Hill, believe it or not. Everybody thinks there's no radon in Chapel Hill. Those are generalizations. Um, I'm getting your okay. presentation. Excellent. That's it. Yeah, no, I'm trying to download it. Oh, okay. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? There it is. Guys at home, I'm going to try to screen share this. Um, just give me one. Maybe I'm set up. There you go. And there you go. Excellent. Let me see if Can you guys see the screen now with the presentation? Yes. Yes. Problem is. yes. All right. <laughs> go up and click on the screen. Yes. Thank you. On the slideshow. There you go. All right, we're in. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so back to the beginning. We'll we'll kind of blow past some of the things that we've already talked about. Yeah, we're we're working. Again, that's me. That's my license uh, info, my um, radon certification. Everybody can see that. Okay. Um, there are several videos that have been sanctioned by the state licensure board that uh, are were intended to help your client. Well, you can see those uh, to help inform your client. These are on YouTube at those links, but they're also posted on the state website that you'll see. We'll, we'll show you the link to that. So there is buyer's right to inspect and offer to purchase, contracting for services, the home inspection, and the home inspection report. And so each of those is, is you know, I think one of them may be 10 minutes long, but they're, you know, three or four up to 10 minutes long. They were designed to help inform your clients on this process. The one thing I'll nitpick, the home inspection video says the words, and our board produced these, and they should know about it. It says the words, if your client is attending the inspection, we recommend you attend. Well, I'm preaching all the time. TMLS lot box rules for home inspectors, we're prohibited from allowing your client in the house if, unless you're there. So that's one thing I would correct about this. We'll touch on that in this too. <clears throat> um, I'm not gonna read these slides except for this one because this paragraph is straight out of the license law and it's important to understand what you're reading in a home inspection report. What is a home inspection? It's a visual inspection of the systems and components of a home to find items that are not performing correctly or that are unsafe. And so that's our two primary uh, missions out there is to find defects or find safety issues. If a problem or a symptom of a problem is found, the home inspector must describe the system or component state how the condition is defective, explain the implications of the condition, and direct the client to a course of action for a repair further investigation by specialist or subsequent observation. There's four parts to that statement. Describe the system or component, state how it's de defective, explain the implications, and direct the client. That's DDID, that's what it's known as. Uh, describe the defect, 
uh, explain the implications and direct the client. Every remark in our report that's dealing with a defect or a safety item should have those four elements. It's not enough if we just tell you there's rotting wood at the door frame. Well, what, what happens if you know if you leave that if you leave that, you're gonna have a lot more than a rotted door frame eventually. You're gonna have rotted actual structural components under, behind, somewhere around that. So the client needs to understand what's the gravity of that thing. Those four elements should be in that remark. We talked about this a little bit already. It's a snapshot of the home on the day we're there. Uh, we can't tell you what happened before. We can't tell you what's going to happen later. Houses are ever changing. We remove normal maintenance panels to inspect HVAC units, return dust, et cetera. But by that standard of practice, an inspector is not required to do any of those things. Move furniture, move wall hangings, move stored equipment or materials, or light pilot lights. A reasonable inspector is going to make a reasonable effort to get the job done. There are some things that we really shouldn't do. We shouldn't light a pot and light. The thing may be shut down for a very good reason that we don't know. So, you know, a, a, an inspector's got to use good judgment. He's got to walk kind of a fine line between what he can do and what he should do uh, to keep himself out of trouble too. Primarily going out to look after your client, but he's got to protect himself also and protect the property that we're in. And we, we talked too about uh, moving furniture, moving wall hangings, that sort of thing. We, we should make a reasonable effort. An inspector could just throw his hands up, but he's probably not going to do very well in business. <clears throat> we mentioned this as a legal presumption that the system or component was inspected unless there's a statement of limitation. If I didn't get to that water heater, I need to tell you that in the report, or else the, the legal assumption is that I did it. Home inspection is not a prediction of or protection against future failure. It's not a warranty. It's not an appraisal. It's not a code inspection. It's not an inspection of adverse uh, environmental conditions or hazardous, uh, hazardous substances. And it's not technically exhaustive. That's what the last line says. What does that mean? These, these are all lines straight out of that. You'll find all of this in there. What does it mean when we say it's not technically exhaustive? If I go in and find a cracked foundation, or find a floor girder deflected, something like that. I've got a structural issue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna record that evidence. I'm gonna explain what I see in the report. I'm gonna direct you to have a structural engineer who will then come in and do that exhaustive uh, investigation. They're gonna bring the lasers. They're gonna bring the equipment they can. And they're, they're also gonna have some knowledge below that foundation. Knowledge of the ground, knowledge of the soil, knowledge of the problems with the soil in the area. That's way past the scope of home inspection, and it is technically exhaustive. That's just one example. But when it says a home inspection is not technically exhaustive, that's what it means. I don't know what that is. Um, what is a home inspector? Should be an unbiased third party professional providing a true opinion. Inspectors are generalists with a wide range of knowledge. Anybody could go and get all of those specialty crafts to come and do a home inspection. Roofer, plumber, electrician, structural engineer, guy with framing experience, uh, any, any, any and all of that. Went to the door guy. Probably cost three or $4,000 and take about a month to get your inspection done. So what the industry settled on years ago was this generalist is good enough for a real estate transaction. It's going to get you a good idea of the condition of that house and what may need attention. You better be a good communicator with good social skills. Uh, every time we're out there, we're meeting with you and your clients and how we interact. It's, it's, it's one thing that's necessary that we're a good technician, but we better be a good communicator with good social skills too, or we're not gonna do very well in business. We've got to, um, home inspectors have to deliver bad news and help you not feel so bad about it. We're not, we're not misleading anybody. We're giving the facts, but how we do it's important. And we touch on that, I think here in a little bit. Something keeps jumping in front of me. Well, I don't know what's going on. We've got a, 
page that's come up. Um, ability to evaluate the systems at home, it should be low drama. Um, home inspectors, if a home inspector ever wrecks a deal, he didn't do his job right. Home inspectors don't wreck deals, homes do. Uh, when we go through, some are really good, some are really bad. But when we go through, when we're doing that review on site and then communicating in that report later, how we do that is important. When I do a review with your client on site and you, um, I'm giving them the straight skinny, but I'm doing it in a way that's informative and helpful and not just, you know, scary run for the hills. Uh, and it can be done, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, it's important that we give them the facts. It's important that we help them understand the gravity of it, but it's also important that we help them not be afraid of something that's not as scary as they might think it is, because typically that client thinks it's a lot scarier than it is. We're, you know, we're typically having to dial that back, not, not get their attention. We're having to talk them off the ledge a little bit. Not our job to talk them off the ledge, but if I can give them information, I had I use an example. Had young first time home buyers this was several years ago. I did the review. I just went over probably 12 or 15 fairly minor things. But this client heard all of this stuff, and I, I finished. I looked her in the eye, and literally, deer and headlights look on her face like she wanted to run. And I told her, you know, an agent standing right there. I told her, look, this is these things. This, this is a great report, frankly. Yeah, there's all these things, but none of them are big. And oh, by the way, they all belong to somebody else today. You and your agent are gonna discuss and, and, and decide what you're gonna ask for, what's a deal breaker or, or, or a good deal for you. So how we communicate what we've technically learned on that inspection is important. Now here we get to the standards of practices, the document that you've got. It's part of the general statutes and contains the administrative code, which takes the laws and writes rules from the law and end up with that standards of practice. Here is the URL for the state website, and in its uh, standards of practice, directory of licensees, and uh, whatever the next line is that I can't see. But that's the URL that will get you to it, which is good to have because we're under the Department of Insurance and part of the state fire marshal's office. So just you know, finding it uh, is, is a little difficult. That licensure act outlines the requirements for an inspector's licensure for a CE, specifies a process for complaints or disciplinary action, outlines the requirements for the inspection agreement, the state dictation language that we'll have in an inspection agreement. And the state also dictates that we will have a summary and there's a paragraph at the top of the summary that's uh, language dictated by the state to help, uh, help them understand you know, in other words, it's basically saying, read the whole report. This is a convenient summary for you, but don't fail to read the whole report. <clears throat> that standards of practice has got these, uh, uh, these 10 systems, structural, that's going to be where we can see it. That's going to be the structure home. Typically, we can only see it in the attic, in a crawl space or basement if it's unfinished. We're not going to be able to see a lot of the structural. Uh, of components of the home. Exterior is everything outside. It's the it's the uh, siding on the house. It's the exterior of the windows, the doors, the sidewalk, the porch, the driveway, the lot grade. Is there anything about that lot that's going to impact the integrity of that home? Those are all parts of the exterior. Roofing, plumbing, electrical, heating, and air conditioning. Interiors. Uh, what you can't see there is insulation and ventilation. That's important because anywhere you've got uh, unconditioned spaces, meeting condition spaces, how those areas are insulated and or ventilated is important. There's two things, two jobs that insulation serves. One is uh, energy efficiency. Everybody knows that. If I don't have double pane windows here or insulation in this exterior wall, I'm not gonna be as energy efficient. The other benefit of insulation in your ceiling, in your floor, in your walls is the temperature differential between that conditioned space and unconditioned. If I've got extremely hot attic and cool house in the summer with no insulation there, I'm gonna have moisture on that ceiling. Next thing you know, I've got mold on the drywall. 
same with walls, same with the floor. So it's it's not just about energy efficiency. It's also about preventing condensation that results in mold and, and damage. Uh, I don't know what's going on here before. We've it's always been pretty easy in the past. Um, so insulation, ventilation, and then built-in kitchen, uh, built-in appliances, built-in kitchen appliances. I think the words there, kitchen. That that means, believe it or not, a refrigerator is not part of the scope. I'll open a refrigerator and shoot the temp in both sides, just to make sure it's reasonable. But I'm not responsible for that refrigerator. Washers and dryers, home inspectors don't, don't do. We're going to look around and looking for anything that might be a leak or a sign of an issue or a problem. <clears throat> we touched on this a little bit while I was ad libbing. I used the exterior system because I could get it on one page. And what that, but each of these sections, each of these 10 systems is broken out this way. The first part is the home inspector shall inspect, and it lists all the things in that system that the home inspector shall inspect. And then it goes on to say the home inspector shall, and this is, you know, the first is you'll inspect all these things. But then the second part is giving you action items will describe the wall cladding material. Well, notice it hasn't required us to describe anything else in that ex exterior system, except the wall cladding, the, the exterior side. There's nothing else about that exterior we have to describe. Now, what I choose to do, and I've got driveways and walkways broken out in a section, porch broken out in a section, I'm talking about those things, but I'm not required to describe anything with the siding. Or to operate all entryway doors, operate garage doors manually or by using install controls for any garage door opener, and report whether or not any garage door operator will automatically reverse or stop when meeting reasonable re resistance during closing, and probe exterior wood components where de deterioration is suspected. A couple of things there. We talked about probing where we suspect uh, damage. Garage doors, and, and we're not going to go through all 10 of these systems and, and, and talk about them technically. Uh, we could, and, you know, it's a different class. But one thing here that is kind of a, you know, not a, not a big problem for me, but, but I want to explain to you that different inspectors do things different ways. And there's two schools of thought on testing garage doors against torque that it will automatically reverse or stop when meeting a reasonable resistance. What's reasonable resistance and how do you test that? Well, there's two schools of thought out there. One is you put a board down and you let the door close on it and before it's completely closed and when it torques out and reverses. Um, I don't use that now. I use my hand because I'm looking for that door to reverse on a reasonable amount of resistance. Now, that board is not going to give you, it's, not, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to make a judgment. If I'm holding that door, I can make a judgment. If I've got to hold that door really hard to get it to reverse, well, that reversal is not going to do any good, any good if it's a kid's rib cage or skull or something under it. If I had to hold it super hard. The other thing, I'll see people go in and put a put a piece of wood in the door doesn't doesn't reverse and you've got a dent in the bottom of the door or they put it at one end and the door gets jacked in the track because it didn't reverse you know, but it torqued the door so we do it with a handheld it's uh uh you, you go online and, and research it and you'll find two camps and they're arguing this is best this is best we choose to do it this way because we can make a reasonable subjective uh decision on that door and we're not risking damaging the door in the process. So that's just my two cents about that. <clears throat> two primary purposes of a home inspection is to find defects and find safety issues. But like I mentioned in here, the state also wants us to describe certain systems and components so that the client has an idea of what those systems and materials are in the home uh, before, you know, during their due diligence period things that have nothing to do with a defect or a safety issue, but it's important for the client to understand what they are. Talk a little bit about um, types of home inspections that you're gonna run across and we could break this out and, and go much deeper. What you can't see at the bottom of there is a pre-purchase, which is the bulk of the business before some, you know, somebody's got a contract, they've got due diligence, they wanna get an inspection during that. But the other, you're killing me. The other types 
phase inspections, what we call phase inspections, phases of a new construction. We do an awful lot of pre-drywall home inspections where five or 10 years ago, they were almost unheard of. Almost nobody did them in this market. They're becoming more and more uh, standard part of, of a new home transaction for clients. There are <clears throat> multiple phases. One that you know, there's a there's a pre-pour phase that really is not a home inspector scope. It's really just you know you'd have to have the same engineering drawings that the builders engineer used to uh, uh, to to determine the steel layout before the concrete poured. Is it done properly? The dimensions properly? Is the steel installed and tied properly? Then you're saying, yeah, it's okay to uh, to pour the concrete. That's a little beyond the scope of home inspector. But the what, what's called a pre drywall, probably have heard of it, if, even if you're not intimately familiar with it. And that's at the phase where the home is framed. All of the systems are roughed in <clears throat> the electrical, the plumbing the HVAC, the gas system, if there is any gas, that sort of, all of those systems are, are installed. They're completely roughed in. You could come in tomorrow and put in the insulation in the drywall, ideally, and you wouldn't have to tear any of it out to do any more with those systems. Bring a, an inspector in at that point, we go through, we're looking at everything top to bottom. We're looking at, typically at that phase, the roof is on, uh, for some reason, if there's any metal roof on the porch or that sort of thing, they don't have that on yet. I'm not sure why, but uh, for the most part, the roof is on, the house is wrapped. So it's essentially dried in. 99.9% of the time, the windows and doors are in. But I have had them where, you know, if the builder and the, and the buyer and, the, and their agent aren't communicating properly, there is such a thing as getting us in there too early. But it's easy to understand the right time because usually there's a hard stop in the project and a pre drywall walkthrough with the client. Well, when you know that, and you're usually going to know that two or three weeks out, so they're pretty easy to schedule because you're going to know ahead when that finite point is on the calendar. Schedule with the inspector, we can go in even the day before and have the report to them that evening. And then you've got the report in hand when you walk to the pre drywall walkthrough with the client. But we find a lot of things. So, you know, we'll find we'll find structural issues. We'll find cracked, uh, damaged uh, roof trusses that they probably banged them on the way up and installed them anyway. And maybe they had a plan to repair that and maybe they were going to get around to it and maybe they slipped through the cracks or whatever but uh, uh, we see a lot of, of damaged trusses they're not throwing that truss away they're putting it in there and they'll get around to repairing it or not but then there's a right way to repair them also and that's an engineering decision but somebody needs to find that point out that uh, that that repair needs to be done um, we find some things like uh, uh, bowed or twisted uh bowed or twisted um wall studs you know there's a lot, of, a lot of different things we find we'll find sometimes the windows just framed in too tight you can barely open the window you know those sorts of things we find four point inspection is a typically an inspection required by an investment lender when you're buying uh, or you've got a client that's buying an investment property, either to flip or to rehab and, and rent, keep as a rental. But they're buying it in a, in a lending structure where they loan the, the purchase and the refurbishment. The lender, those are specialized lenders. That's not your, your movement board and all. There's, there's lenders that specialize in that. But what they want is a four-point inspection of that property, the roof, the HVAC, the electrical, and the, uh, the pump. It's, and it's usually outside the scope of North Carolina home inspection because that lender wants it done their way in their software or on their spreadsheet or however they do it. And they also don't want to pay anything for it. So they're usually using guys that are either really new or not very good. So they got plenty of time and they're willing to do it for their price. You know, these, these are, these are $400 inspections. They want to pay $200 for So typically when an inspector comes along, you do a lot of them when you're new because you want to do anything, anytime, anywhere for anybody. But once you get enough business that you can name your price, then you move away from these and they find they find the next guy. So that, that just kind of is what it is. Then the follow up on that is something called a draw inspection. That uh, buyer 
has bought the house now, closed on the house. They're doing that refurbishment project. In the original lend, there's enough money to do a first phase of refurbishment. They're not going to let you draw on any more of that money until they have some assurance that the amount of work you say has been done has been done. Those are a, those are a quick, simple walkthrough. If and they send me a spreadsheet and it says the kitchen is 70% done and I walk through and in my opinion the kitchen's only 30% done, we're lopping off 40% of whatever that part of that money was going to be, send it back to the lender and go from there. It's it's more of an art than a science. Inspectors are not the arbiter for defect resolution. We're finding all these things, but an inspector needs to be respectful and understanding of the relationship that the client has with you and what your job is. An inspector can dig you a hole standing there in that review if they're not smart. And, it, you know, sometimes an inspector can say too much and it makes you, it makes it harder for you to, to, to negotiate then, figure out how to negotiate these things. It's not the inspector's job to tell them how these things should be resolved. That resolution uh, is between the agent and the client. Our sole purpose is to provide an unbiased opinion of the condition of the home that day. And you're going to determine and advise them how to handle the issues discovered. There are things a home inspector doesn't know about that deal that the agent does. What's the mindset of the seller? What do, what do you know from the, from the other agent? You're going to know all those things an inspector doesn't. An inspector needs to be careful and stop at, at, at his, you know, stay in his lane, if you will, uh, so that we don't uh, uh, complicate things unnecessarily. Now, in that review, I'm delivering technical information in an unemotional manner. If you are the client, ask me a question about that structural issue. I'm going to share what I know about that to the extent that I know. And if I don't know anything, I'm going to tell you. The first thing I should tell you is if I don't know something. Um, but I'm going to share with you from my experience, um, you know, oh, you, you, you've got an old uh, 1958 brick ranch and you've got a corner crack from the window on this side and you go around the corner of the house you got on that the corners drooped. Well, that's probably going to be at least two helical piers, and they're going to cost twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a piece. You know, that's not a thirty, forty thousand dollar problem. You know, that may be a five thousand dollar problem. Maybe I'm not going to make any promises, but I'm going to share. If you ask, I'm going to share. If your client ever asks me, "Would you buy this house?" and they will, they'll ask me, "Would you buy this house?" Here's my answer. It doesn't matter what I would do. I don't have your situation. This may be the perfect location. This may be the best house for you. This may be where you want to live, near your work, near your school, near your relatives. None of that matters to me. So it doesn't matter what I would do. I'm going to tell you the technical condition of the house, but I'm not going to get involved in helping you make a decision. <clears throat> Ancillary inspections, additional services, and additional costs. Most home inspectors will do at least a few. Some home inspectors do many. We do many. Termite, um, we bring the termite down of about 70% of our inspections. Um, we bring radon testing, usually 65, 67% of our inspections include radon testing. HVAC diagnostic, that would be an HVAC inspection that goes beyond the scope of a home inspector. We're doing a visual and a functional. We're not taking anything apart. We're not putting gauges on, checking the refrigerants, that sort of thing. But we can bring, if you want, for an additional fee, we can bring an HVAC tech and do that full-blown diagnostic. We have some agents who want that on every inspection. Okay, we've got two or three, you know, it's gonna be who's available at that day and that time. Uh, to come and do it. Swimming pools. We can do swimming pools and hot tubs in house. Detached buildings. I'll talk about that for a minute. I can't speak to how every other inspector does, but I do what I think is pretty reasonable. If a house has a detached garage, but has no attached garage, I don't charge extra for that building because the net additional work for me 
is one exterior wall. Because if that building was attached over here, it would be part of the standard home inspection anyway. If there's an attached garage and a detached garage, I'm charging for that. If there's an attached garage and a detached shop building or those sorts of things, you know, we're going to charge for that. And then once we're charging for an attached building, it's going to be based on what's in that building. If it's just a shell with some roll up doors and, and, and it's sitting over here and I don't have an attached, that's costing nothing. But if it's, but if it's over here and it's got an apartment above and I've got HVAC and electrical and finished spaces and an attic and plumbing and all, uh, you know, okay, well that, that's going to add to, to the fee, you know, we, and we try to do a reasonable, but we're, we're, we're in this to, to make money. And so we're not, we're not doing free work. We're also trying not to take advantage of anyone. So we, we do that on a, on a case by case basis, uh, on detached buildings, chimney inspectors, home inspector can tell you what's in the firebox. We can see that we can see the exterior of that chimney, uh, typically with the exception of the, of the very top of the cap and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the crown, unless there's an upstairs window or a third floor or an attic uh, ability to, to look out and see the top of that. Very often we're not able to see the top of the chimney, <clears throat> but we're not able to see the interior flue on that chimney. We have a contractor a company called Smoke Alert who can come and do that. Uh, if it's a wood fire chimney, it's automatically going to include a, a chimney sweep because they've got to clean it before they can inspect it anyway. So that's the $250, $300 range uh, for a service, but we can do those. The other thing is if we, there's a chimney inspection involved, it's got to be an 8 a.m. inspection. The chimney guys are like the cable guys. <clears throat> As their day goes on, their schedule slides. So the only time we can get them there in a reliable window is the first appointment of the day. So if it's chimney, it's an 8 a.m. inspection. Mold and indoor air quality, those go hand in hand. Now, Again, I can't speak for other home inspectors uh, or people who specialize in mold. We can do mold and indoor air quality testing. What does that mean? If you go in a home and you smell something, but you see no sign of anything, that's an indoor air quality test. We can, we can find out what's floating in the air. Now that may lead you to whatever, somebody needs to start tearing walls out. We can do <clears throat> some infrared um, I don't use infrared. I don't, I don't know of any inspector who, who uses infrared as a standard part of the home inspection because you just cre create more trouble than you than you solve. But we'll use it as an investigative tool if we've got some hint that there's mold somewhere but we can't see physical signs of it. We're going to use a moisture meter and we're going to use an infrared to try and find cold spots uh, or, or moisture. When I say cold spikes, it's cold relative on the infrared spectrum. It's blue relative to whatever's warm. If I came in here, there's a bathroom on the other side of the wall and there's water leaking into the wall. When I look at that, <clears throat> this is going to range from, from yellow to, to orange to tan, and then there's going to be a blue spot where there's moisture. So we can we can see it that way. So we're uh, we're not the guys to call uh, if you're if you're looking for a mold detected, we're the guys to call if you see mold and you want it tested to find out what it is, we can absolutely come in and pull a sample. If you just smell something, but you see no sign of, we can come in and do indoor air quality. That's quick and simple. Those are typically, depending on the size of the house and, and how widespread the, the problems are, it's typically two or three samples indoors and then a comparative sample outdoors. Because if whatever your, your problem is, is prevalent outdoors, good luck, you're not going to be able to do anything about it indoors. So you always do that comparative test outdoors. We had a house in uh, Northeast Raleigh a couple of weeks ago. They had a flood event several years ago. The guy called me, on the, in fact, it was a Wendy Lyman referral. Uh, guy called, he had a flood in the home several years ago. They got it all repaired. They moved out for eight weeks, came home, it was like eight inches of water on the floor from something that had been running for hours. Moved out eight weeks, people come in, strip out everything, do all the tests. And I, years ago, but I don't remember how many years. <clears throat> and fast forward now, they don't have any signs in the house, but he's having some health issues. So he goes to get testing 
and something in the blood testing indicates that he's breathing some type of, of mold. And I'm not sure what the what the diagnostic was, but that was the, his evidence. I'm breathing something. Can you come and do it? So I did. Three levels of the house. We did a test on each level. The flood originated in the master bathroom, so we did that level in the master bedroom. Then his office was on the third floor. We did a test up there. Three tests indoors, one outdoors. The master bedroom came back extremely high aspergillus penicillin. He was breathing something in the house. While we were there, because each of those air samples were, were drawing 150 liters of air through a, through a little filter sample. Each one of those takes about 10 minutes. So while those are running, we're going around with a moisture meter in my infrared attachment. And we found in two different bathrooms in the laundry room where they had some trouble spots under the tile inside the wall that may have nothing to do with the flood event from years ago but something's going on there now. So we were able to tell him quite a bit, you know, a little, little bit of a sidebar, but we can we can tell an awful lot from an indoor air quality test. And then well and septic, if the house has got a uh, well and septic system, a uh, little bit about septic. There was a time that I did not encourage people to get a septic test on a new construction. Those days are over. I advise every buyer of a new home to get a septic inspection. Because only then do you know all the thinners and paints and all the other crap that was put down that system that's going to keep it from being an effective septic system because no microbes are going to be able to live in there. So now I advise septic inspection on, on new construction also. Water analysis. <clears throat> that's an ability, like, like the mold and indoor air quality, that's something I do in-house. Our wellness septic providers have very reasonable prices on well and then water testing if they're doing a septic inspection. That's the business they're in. They don't want to drive out just to look at a well and take a water sample. Not, not much money in it. So they triple the cost of that if they're doing it without septic. So um, to, to help alleviate that, I can do water analysis. It's not going to be a well inspection, but it is going to tell you what's in the water. Um, I wouldn't advise if you have a client who is on a municipal system or a county system or that sort of thing, I would advise, you know, every now and then we'll get a call from someone who wants a water test on that. Don't pay me, go, go get the test that they keep on file. Some of the private water companies, community systems, I wouldn't be as confident about because I know all the horror stories in the triangle of people on some of those systems. It's municipal or county. I think you can trust them. They've got, you know, they do a good job. Um, but certainly on the well or on a, a, if you've got questions, anecdotal evidence about a community system, we can do water analysis on that. And then sewer scope is that last. We've got a camera we can run down. If you've got a house with a really old sewer line or a tree issue, something sketchy looking, run a camera down that line and tell you what the system's doing. Old uh, plumbing systems, cast iron, galvanized, those sorts of things, they corrode and deteriorate from the inside. So even in a crawl space, if we have, you know, and, and I'm talking about the underground stuff, there's no way to know what's underground until you look at it. But to share with you how we look at those old pipes in a crawl space or in a basement, we've learned that if there's cast iron or galvanized drain pipes, we report that they're there and we advise having a plumber evaluate. Because they both fail from the inside, uh, and by virtue of the fact that they haven't even been used for 40 plus years, anytime you see them, they're, they're at the end of their useful lifespan. And they're failing from the inside, so you won't know it. If you ever go see cast iron pipe that's got a little, almost like a little mole build up on it, that is seepage from a pinhole inside where that wall has failed and you're starting to get little uh, moisture and corrosion products building up. It'll build up almost as big as an acre on the side of that. Sometimes you'll have them all the way down the pipe. That pipe has failed. It needs to go. But even if we see no outward sign, we're advised them to have a plumber scope them because they're close to the end. Not to be scary, but it's just, you know, things we've learned the hard way. 
Booking the inspection. If you've done them, you, you know, but uh, an inspector needs to know the address and the square footage and the age of the home. Those are the three things that are going to determine the cost of the, of the primary home inspection. Where is it? How big is it? And how old is it? Um, we've got mileage adders after 40 miles, but I'm in the Briar Creek area, so you can cover the whole triangle before you hit that uh, with us. Age of the home, we start uh, uh, hitting uh, an age fee over 75 years. We probably should drop that down to, to 50. We get some really old stuff. Our oldest home now is 1814. We recently inspected the oldest home in Chapel Hill. I think the name of it's Hopwood 60 House. 1814 in Chapel Hill. We've got uh, a, one of my inspectors has a close friends asking us to come to Rocky Mountain and do an 1810 farmhouse. Um, are the utilities on? Very important. Um, if we get there and the gas is not on, meters locked out, whatever, we're not stopping. We're doing everything that we can. We're going to take limitation on everything related to that gas. I, I can't speak to how other inspectors do it, but we have in our in our technology and our front end process, we've got notification emails and reminder text. Every time that there's a listing agent involved, and we can always pull that information because it's, you know, when we do the show and time or, or whatever, we can pull who's that agent. We pull them into that order and they get included on those reminder emails. But we're saying, please ensure the utilities are on. So if we get there and something is not on, we're not stopping, we're not calling, we're doing everything that we can, we're charging that fee, and the guy has to pay us to come back because that spot was taken up by that inspection. We don't want to be harsh about it, but it's incumbent on on the seller, especially on the seller side, it's incumbent on, on them to have the house ready for an inspection. And sometimes there's never, I don't want to say there's never a good excuse. There's usually not a good excuse for it not happening. But what usually may happen, somebody's moved out of the house and the listing agent told the owner, you know, they, they've been out for a while, so the gas has been locked out. The listing agent tells the owner, have the gas turned back on for the inspection. The owner says, okay. And the agent takes it at face value, and we show up, there's still a lock on the meter. That happens, you know. Uh, somebody said it, but nobody verified it. So you're getting less of an inspection with, with typically no discounting because somebody didn't do their job. Um, <clears throat> vacant or occupied, that's, that's really not vital. What that means, and the reason we ask, two things. The vacant or occupied and are you guys attending? <clears throat> Those are primarily so we know if my guy finishes up, he goes in a house at one o'clock and he's knocked it out by three o'clock and he knows nobody's coming, boom, he's done. He's not waiting for anybody. It's good to know. Uh, not absolutely vital, but it's good to know. And if the house is vacant, if we're running a little early, probably okay to, to roll on in and get a jump on, on that also. Uh, and then the client contact info. Obviously, we need their name, we need their email address, and we need their uh, phone number. We had a situation just yesterday. The agent, most of the time, is the agent booking the order. The agent booked the order, put his phone number, and email address in for the client. Well, I had the office calling. You know, or you know, you you you're going to make sure she she gets that signed. Yeah, yeah, I'll make sure she gets it signed. Uh, I just put that in there so that you can send the report to me and I can decide when I'm ready for it to go. No, sir. No, sir. That person is our client. That's who we ha will have a contract with. That's who we're serving. They're going to get, the now we'll send it to the agent at the same time. And it says in our agreement, when you sign our agreement, you're agreeing to share it with the agent at the same time you get it. But no, we're not. We're not sending it to the agent, let them decide when to share it with the client. That's not, uh, frankly, it's not legal. Um, and then any ancillary services that, uh, that might be desired. So uh, on our system, you can go in and uh, 
book all of this online. If you uh, if you get nothing in but your name and, and phone number or email address, you're going to get a contact from the office asking, can we help you? But uh, uh, agents that work with us a lot, they just drop these orders in. Everything's in there. We review it. We do the show and time appointment. And the next thing they see is an email confirming that uh, that we're good to go. So it's pretty pretty easy. Uh, most uh, inspection companies have some form of, of online uh, uh, booking and online payment. Uh, our initial email to the client has two links in it. One's a link to the inspection agreement. They can go in and review that and e-sign it, come straight back to us. There's a second link in there <clears throat> they can pay online with any credit card. They can pay on site, cash, check, credit card. We get almost, we get cash maybe once or twice a year. We almost never even get checks anymore. I think we've had five checks in the last six months, probably or less. It's great. High tech. In fact, it's funny. You know, we pay fees on credit card processing, but we have to go to the bank with the check. So it's almost like, you know, yeah, I'd rather I'd rather pay the and where our fees are so good, I'd rather have a credit card than a check anyway. The inspection agreement must be signed by the client prior to the inspection. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a home inspector licensure requirement by the state of North Carolina. It's also required by the inspector's insurance company. Our insurance company is extremely frank about that. If you go into a home or go onto a property and something bad happens and you don't have a signed agreement, don't waste your time calling us. You're not covered. So it's a hard stop for us. I know there are people historically who've done it, kind of played a little fast and loose with it. We will not. It's a hard stop if we don't have that sign uh, before that inspection starts. Um, and the inspector must not enter the property without signed agreement. I think there's a, a fourth bullet there that uh, says we often need the agent's assistance to get that done. And we've got a process for that too. We've got reminders 24 hours out. They're just, even if it's signed, remind you and them that the inspection is coming up tomorrow. If it's not signed yet, we've got another email that goes to both of you that says we must have this signed. My office will call for next day stuff at like five before she leaves. If it's still not signed by about 6.30 or seven, I've got a, an email that I send personally and copy the agent and it's got red letters in it that, you know, it's in, in it, Usually within an hour or so of that email, if nothing else has worked, it's signed after that because I'm making it clear in red letters this inspection won't happen if we don't have a signed agreement. Should the rule church in? Should. Uh, at least for the reason, most of the time anymore, people, people are busy. Unless the client wants to be there the whole time, uh, typically you guys are bringing them toward the end of the inspection. Sometimes they're excited, they want to measure, they want to dream, they want to hang out, they want to spend some time in the spot. And that's cool too. But uh, most of the time people are coming toward the end for the review. And our lockbox rules prohibit us from letting the client in without the realtor. I know a lot of people play a little fast and loose with that too, but what's going to happen to my business if I lose my lockbox privileges? Are you, and I'm the one inspector that you know that would have to have you make the appointment and be there to open the door. Uh, can't afford that. You being there and being involved in that review helps that client understand the process and, and the things we're talking about in the uh, in the review and enhances the uh, buyer's comfort level. And then also you want to know um, callbacks. One of the things that I say at the end of every review, and my guys do too. When you get this report, if you have any questions, call me. Sometimes that'll be the next day. Sometimes it's funny. I get a I get an email the first time you open the report. I get an email the first time your client opens the report. Some of y'all don't open them until six weeks later. <laughs> it's okay with me, but but I know when you open them. Um, but sometimes we'll get a call, or sometimes we'll get a call from a client. Six months later, asking about something that they don't understand or something that they found and nine times out of 19 times out of 20, it's in the report, but they didn't read the report first. 
So what I say is, when we get a call back, as far as I'm concerned, we can't uh, get to you fast enough, but, uh, but it's also important for us to understand what we're talking about. Because even if you call me two days later, I might be four houses away from that one. I need that report open in front of me. Yes, ma'am. I just got a, um, my client, well, the buyer, buyer agent sent me a copy of the inspection. It was like 85 pages long. I mean, the average person is not going to sit there and go through 85 pages. I mean, I was like, wow. Some of them, our average is probably 25, 30, oh, maybe 35 pages. But, <laughs> but some houses are 85 page reports. Uh, I went to house, I went to house last week. I took 273 photos and the report was 75 pages long. I'm not putting a single thing in there that I don't think I need to put in. We're not putting fluff in. We're not, I can't speak for I've seen them where they have, where they do. Or maybe they'll take, um, you know, they'll find some cracked shingles and they want to show you pictures of every day and crack shingle on the roof. You know, I find a few, I'm going to refer you to a roofer and I'm going to show you a few examples. Same with caulk, same with rotted siding. I don't need to show you every example. So a lot of times that will be what makes a report extra long. The nail pops. He the nail pops, every yeah. single nail no, pops. No, no. I'm going to show a few examples <laughs> and refer you to the contractor. So that, yeah. I think yeah. it was me. <laughs> he'll get he'll get better. <laughs> um, and whatever my last bullet there is. So any questions on this? Um, I think uh, Morgan's going to talk about uh, the, the things you are found in an inspection and then how do you deal with them. I'm going to sit in the back and shut way up and just to, if you have questions for me, feel free sure. to uh, <clears throat> let me know. All right, guys, I'm Morgan Womble. I don't know everybody in here, but I know some faces. Um, you know, first thing I'll say is that who thinks home inspectors are here to kill a deal? <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, no, they're not. I mean, they're here, obviously, to help inform our buyers, like he was talking about, help us through the process. Um, you know, I think it's in this market. Is it? We're talking. We're supposed to be talking about negotiations, right? And that's that's the one thing I love the best. I love negotiating. If I could do that all day long, every day, then that's what I would do. It just makes me happy for some reason. Okay, but and it's exciting. But I think a lot of people, it's it's really scary to a lot of people, but it's scary to a lot of agents. And then a lot of these repair issues pop up. You know, he's been doing this a long time, right? You may might not have been doing it as long, right? So you see these reports and you're looking at these things, and it's scary. So we have to really do a good job. And yeah, you know, I think the most important thing is partnering with somebody like Ed, who has the knowledge but also has like the bedside manner, you know, right? It's like having a good doctor. Okay, the doctor can come in and tell you like, yeah, stage four, you'll be dead in two weeks, okay? But, or he can come back and say, okay, this is our treatment options, this is what we have. You still might be dead in two weeks, but, you know, at least he's there to, to kind of help you through the process, okay? Um, so that to me, and I've had some really good home inspectors over the years, and I've had some really, bad home inspectors over the years that maybe we're new or maybe we're just having a bad day and they they become alarmists right they're alarmists and then in, in, in my opinion now some of the things to them may have been serious serious issues but the way they were presented ed said he presents things kind of in a unbiased states the facts it is what it is it may be kind of boring but i think that's a really good home inspector a boring home inspector, you know, when he presents things, is a good home inspector. Okay, if he's excited and acting like you know, and, you know the world's going to end, that that's not what your buyer wants to hear. Um, so, I don't have a, a presentation or like that. I just thought we'd talk a little bit. Um, you know, right now in this market, guys, what's the one thing we have to do in order to even get a home inspection? What's the one thing you have to do? You have to get something accepted. 
So that's the hardest part in this market. You've got 2,400 homes or less on the market. In, in a healthy market, we're supposed to have 12 to 10 to 12, 13,000 homes on the market. Okay, so we're at 2,400 right now. Now I think that's going to change a little bit this spring. Okay, but for buyers, it's almost it's it's tough. I don't want you to get frustrated and things like that. But with the inventory so low, you know, say you've got a, a buyer who wants to buy two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, right? And of course, they all want to be inside the belt line, and they want to. Well, that's not going to happen, obviously. So we need to set that expectation. But if you do have a buyer that wants a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and you find that two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, more than likely, how much due diligence are they going to put down? on that house, if it's a hot house. If they've got 40 showings in two days and there's 10 or 12 offers, what would be, who thinks what, you know, what might, what amount might be the due diligence? 10,000? Yeah, I'd say probably 10. That's what I'm saying, 10, 15, I'm seeing 20. You know, so those buyers that are buying a $250,000 house typically are your first time home buyers. And most of them don't have $10,000 to put down. Okay, but if they do and they get that house, they've already got 10,000 hard money up front tied into that house. Unless there's a material fact or something that the seller you know, hid from you, you know, that's the only way you're getting that due diligence money back, right? If there was a material fact that the seller did not disclose. Okay, so, so you call Ed and say, hey, Ed, we want to do our home inspection, which I totally recommend. You know, you, you need to have Ed or whoever the home inspector is come out. But day one, that buyer's already got 10 grand in this house. Okay. How many buyers that are buying a 250000 dollars house do you think can walk away from $10,000? I mean, I don't want to walk away from, you know, no way. So that's kind of the quandary we're in. Now I'm pretty sure the real estate commission and other people and other professionals, people with much higher pay grades than us, are going to work on these things and try to figure them out. Um, but I mean, we're in a competitive market. Okay. We're in a competitive market. We used not to have due diligence money and we only had earnest money years and years and years ago. Okay. And so that was a little bit easier in those type of markets, but we also didn't have only 2,400 homes on the market. So we had a lot more homes and choices for people to choose from. So, so from a negotiation standpoint, are you negotiating from a very strong position? As a buyer, if you've already got ten thousand dollars in on a in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, so Ed comes back with this report and says, "Hey, we've got these issues and and, and these things wrong." Who's your who's your buyer going to be mad at, right? If they come back and all these things are wrong on this report, they're not going to be mad at Ed. They're going to be mad at you because you told them to write a ten thousand dollar due diligence check. To get the deal. So, so having a general knowledge, in my opinion, before the home inspector even gets there is very, very important. Now, I don't, I'm a general contractor. I mean, I build houses also, but when I'm walk, when I have my realtor hat on, I'm not a general contractor that day. Okay. I'm not, but I do have that knowledge to kind of help them through that process. Um, so I think you know, if we don't have knowledge about crawl spaces and moisture and vapor barriers and kind of a lot of the typical things you see here, like a couple of reports that Ed shared, the summaries, I mean, I see those things, like most of those items you see a lot. Okay, the ground, the, the wiring not being grounded, I mean, all the uh, GFCIs, you know, for, I saw on there for the, the septic pump or something like that. I mean, there, there's certain things like that you see a lot of. Um, and those aren't big deals because they're really not, but you need to have enough knowledge and you're not going to know that when you're walking through, but when you go in the house and you open the crawl space door and you look in and it's, you, you smell and it's moist and it's wet and you look on the joist and you wipe it with your finger and you see black come off on your finger, then you know that generally there's going to be some moisture in the crawl space. Now, you may not crawl that day in the crawl space with your buyer before you make an offer and look at it, but that might help determine to your buyer, like, okay, this house might have some issues, might be some moisture in the crawl space. It's in the location I want. 
It's what I want. It's the only house available right now in this price range. There's five other cars in parked out front. Okay. Am I willing? And all that, that's an excitement, right? It's like an auction. It's like an auction. They're auctioning the house. It's going to the highest bidder. Okay. Whoever, or, or whoever's got the best deal, cash, lots of due diligence, whatever. So is that buyer willing to risk 10 grand due diligence or 15 or whatever it may be if he knows that, hey, during negotiations, that seller's probably not going to fix that because they may have a backup offer that I don't even know about right behind mine. And they might have a backup offer behind that one. So that's kind of the, the situation we're in when it comes to negotiating. It's really tough to negotiate right now for your buyer. That, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, it seems like to me, at least with my sellers, with listings that I have, most of my sellers still want to do the right thing for the most part. Some do not. Some just say, well, I've got $10,000 of their money. I don't really care what they find when I'm fixing anything. Okay. And, and there's certain people have that personality. Uh, but most sellers will be reasonable to a certain extent. Now, do I think they're going to take $5,000 out of their pocket and fix something when they've already got 10 grand of, of the buyer's money and they've got two other offers? No, they're not going to, and they shouldn't be expected to. Um, so something else that Ed mentioned that I thought was really good is, is Ed was talking about home inspectors generally do talk in, in, in almost generalizations, right? And the way they, they write things in their reports and things like that, you know, they don't, you know, if the roof looks like it may need to be replaced. They'll say, you know, maybe the, the shingles appear as if they've reached the end of their effective life, okay? recommend, but, but the roof's not leaking, right? So it's, it's performing the function for which intended, which we used to hear all the time, way back, okay? But it's not leaking. I recommend having a professional roofing contractor come take a look at the roof. Okay, so then the buyer knows, per Ed's comment, that most likely the roof needs to be replaced. Okay, now does that mean that the seller's gonna give you a new roof or give you money for a new roof? Most likely not. In this market, you know, Back in 2009 or 2010, yeah, you probably could have gotten a new roof or money for it or whatever you wanted. Um, so those are things to think about, but because home inspectors think in those generalizations, it's also really good to have relationships with licensed plumbers, with licensed electricians, with general contractors, with structural engineers, with septic guys, with guys that pump septic. Sometimes those are two different people, right? Um, because Ed, if Ed has a good bedside manner, right, and he's, he talks to the people, well, they may want some additional information. So if you have those people where you can call and say, hey, Mr. Plumber, like I've got a plumber I, I, I trust, and we've got these issues, here's the issues, what are we looking at cost-wise? And he'll look at the report. He's not going to give me an exact price because he's not actually looking at the physical item at the property. Okay, he said, well, you're looking at three or 400 bucks. You know, and I can have, okay, well, can you send me a little email? And he'll send me an email, so I have that. Okay, electrician, same thing. Septic, um, we're having a lot of issues with septic right now because of all the rain we've had, right? So I've got three properties right now that are under contract. Uh, two of them are my listings, another one's a buyer that one of my buyer's agents is rep, uh, representing. And we've had so much rain we use a company called Brantley and Sons. Okay, they go out and they inspect the septic. Well, they lift the lid, it's completely full, lines are full, you know, everything's full. And so he can't really do a proper inspection. And if I'm wrong anytime, Ed, stop me. No, you're right. But he, there's so much water in the ground, it can't leak from the drain field. Right. And so it's just gonna back up. So it's gonna back up, right? So until this rain stops and so we've got a due diligence period right okay what's today the 24th we've got a due diligence period that, that is friday the 26th and we had the septic inspection 10 days ago but it still hasn't dried out enough to let the, the water to, 
to where we know if the leach field is warping or not. And so the only way to do is to get it has to be dry enough, giving them come pump the tank, right? And then you can at least look at the tank, but it, they can't do it when it's this wet. So, and so they, you're having lots of problems like that. So it's really helpful to have these, these professionals with licenses also, they can talk your buyer and say, look, this is, we don't know that the septic system is functioning properly because we can't test it right now. Okay. That being said, they can at least talk them off the edge. Okay. Talk them off the edge. So in this particular case, we don't know that there's something wrong. We're still closing next week. We're holding back $10,000 from the seller, right? In escrow with the attorney. So if there is a failed system, we've got 10 grand and it's a conventional system, plenty of good soil, it's a 10 acre lot. So we've got, we already know where our repair area is. It'd be a conventional system, things like that. So we know 10 grand would cover it based on our conversation and our client's conversation with the septic company. Okay, so 10 grand would plenty, be plenty of money to cover that, any repair or replacement for this particular property and that particular system, not all systems. Um, but there's things like that you have to, does anybody understand what I was talking about or not understand by holding back 10, 10 grand at closing? Everybody understand? Okay. Um, and typically, you know, if you're representing the buyer in that situation and you're trying to communicate that to the agent, it really helps to have a good working relationship with the agent on the other side. Okay. Because if you have an adversarial relationship with the agent on the other side, you're never going to be able to get a deal like that worked out. Okay. Where the seller is holding, you know, you're going to hold back from getting that 10 grand at closing. So that's the other thing I, I really think is key to negotiations is starting things out on the right foot with, if you're a buyer agent and you're working with listing agents, it is communication and quality communication. Okay. Because if you start it off, I have so many agents I've had in the past, they think it's like a battle or like a game who can get their client the best deal. Well, that's to me, not what this business is about. I mean, if it's not a win for your client and a win for the person on the other side, and you just burned a bridge with an agent, that's not, you're not going to have a whole lot of longevity in this business. So, um, to me, that's extremely important. And then when you do run across complicated issues, whether it be structural or septic system issues, something that can be pricey, HVAC issues, um, you know, if you have a good working relationship with that agent, you're going to be able to say, Hey, Mr. Listing agent, Mrs. Listing agent, please call my septic guy, talk with him, you know, and also feel free to get another opinion. Okay. And sometimes you have the two septic guys talking to each other, right. To come up with a solution that way, everybody tr is trusting in the process. Hey, we're not trying to get one over on you or anything like that. Um, but I think that's, that's super important. Any questions so far about anything? And I, I'll try to get us out of here quick just because of lunch and everybody's probably getting hungry. Um, let's see. Something else that I think is really important is, you know, what is, what is the buyer's goal in the purchase? Okay. Um, if, if you're got a buyer, he's just trying to buy 250,000 dollars house, but his goal is to find a house and to close on it right now. Now, two years, he might have a completely different goal. Okay. There might be a, a bunch of 250,000 dollars houses in a couple of years, but there's not right now. So what's his goal and how does that align with your goal? Okay. If your goal is only to, to close houses and only make money and not do what's best for your client, then you've got a little bit of conflicting goals and a conflicting mission there. So I think it helps to understand what your client's goal is. Some clients have a higher tolerance for repairs than others. You know, some clients, they don't, they literally do not care. They just want a house. You know, they grew up, maybe, maybe we don't know how they grew up. And you know, maybe they grew up in something that 
you know, this, this 150, 200,000 our house with a leaky roof and mold in the crawl space is much nicer than what they grew up in. So to them, it may not be a big deal. To other people, you know, there's health concerns, um, just any, any number, they have small children, they're worried about radon, they're worried about whatever it is. I mean, I've had radon tests. I have one come back in Wakefield at 65 in Wakefield, okay? I mean, and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen one that high. I said, 65, I said, this is crazy. Something must be something wrong with the test. So we had a complete, another retest. It came back in like 63 or something like that, okay? You know, that buyer, he was an attorney, two young kids, wife stayed at home with the kids. Um, you know, he, he understood. I sat down with both of them. We talked about it. Um, I said, you know, we'll try to put a mitigation system in. If you're, if you're comfortable with that, they were completely comfortable with it. They were completely fine. They have the company come out once. You know, they have the company come out now once a year annually, and they do another test just to you know, ensure the system will have an alarm if it's not functioning properly, okay? But they still have the company come out once a year and do another test. They were completely fine for it with it. I can guarantee you a lot of other buyers would have flipped out and this, it absolutely would, would not have worked, okay? So it really depends on that tolerance. Um, let's see. Question, sir. Yes, sir. How can you remedy that, that 65? That, just their mitigation system. I mean, sometimes mitigation systems. Go ahead, Ed. Real quick, what you do is you, you basically redirect. That gas comes up out of the ground. So what you do is you capture it before it can migrate into the house and exhaust it above the house into the atmosphere. They run twelve fifteen hundred dollars and they can do an amazing job with, with some really high levels. Yeah. I mean, and I, I have seen one property where they could not get it below it was on a slab and it was out in eastern franklin county and for whatever reason i don't i mean i was not involved in the transaction there was another agent involved but for whatever reason they never could it was a small little 1400 square foot house you know they couldn't get that one below four i think they got it over four and a half or something like that what's this problem you gotta be careful what you said to your buyer right but probably not a big difference between four and four and a half okay in my eyes so, um, Morgan, yes. um, just talking about the tolerance and leveraging your um, partners, um, ours is closing in December. My client was a brand new client, his wife was pregnant and he had a radon and he uh, was sorry. worried about moving in and that um, it was going to be like three weeks, I think three or four weeks after closing where they can get in and get that mitigation system in. Mm -hmm. So he was concerned about that and I helped run inspector. And he was he was explaining there's not really that much concern in that that short period. And then I had my inspector who was also the, my client was their client, and he, they talked, and so they were able to um, come to a conclusion that he was comfortable with them going ahead with that closing on an end right. December instead of waiting until January. Was that the one on that we had together? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what what was the what was the uh, level on that one? I can't remember. I know. It was about 14 or something. Yeah. I think it was pretty hot. The, well, the effects of radon are very similar to the effect, essentially the same as the effect of smoking. Right. And it's a long term exposure. Mm -hmm. It's three weeks. You know. Right. So, so you can, you know, so if you have clients that are worried about short term exposure, it just, it just isn't that big of a concern. But I wasn't comfortable with having that, having that conversation with him and telling him that. So I had the inspector actually call He helped you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good, but he helps you out. And, and, you know, now that system's in, they're good. You know, now if the system had gone in and the retest came back still high, then potentially, you know, that's the risk you take as a buyer, right? So if the buyer, your buyer said, you know what? Yes, we'll go ahead and close. We'll wait on the system because everybody's busy right now. It's tough. Okay, we'll wait two weeks after closing to get the system in. System comes back in and it still tests over four. And, you know, they do another, you know, they try to work it out. I mean, that that's just a risk the buyer took, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we, we talked through that and right. um, I documented it, um, which is something that we have to do as real estate agents. And, um, but he also talked to the inspector about what that looks like if it does come back negative. I mean, right. it's still high. Yep. So they walked through that entire process and 
he was very comfortable with that. Yeah, and I think that's the right way to handle that situation. Well, um, yeah, yes, sir. I'll get right on class, and I think you guys have that already on Zoom here. But we've done them periodically. Uh, we've done a lot, and then during during COVID, we've done them. Uh, I think at least one or maybe two cycles on Zoom. So I know Wendy or Jessica or somebody may have access to that. But yeah. what that does, that's that was a class designed for what is helpful for agents to know everything from what what it is we're talking about, how does it develop, where does it come from, what are the health effects once it gets into the house, how do we test for it, and how is it mitigated. And that includes breathing air and water. So, um, so for right. you, I think you guys are ahead. It's about an hour long, also. Um, yeah. um, I think that's something I think that you've got it recorded, but I'm happy to do it. You know, yeah, and that might be something that would even be good uh, in a video like that. Um, we have to probably have to be really careful about it. I mean, they go on the EPA and look at information. And everything I'm talking about in that is, uh, is not that hard to find right. online. Right. And, you know, because, I mean, you, you start typing in radon on the Internet, and, I mean, it can quickly spiral out of control when people get scared to death. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, I, I tell people that we don't sell radon so much as we, we educate and offer the service. And I would tell them if they, because sometimes people don't know anything about it. And I'll say, Google EPA residential radon. They've right. got some good handbooks on there for, for buyers and sellers and that sort of thing, too. Right. Yeah, I think that's really good information. Um, so as far back to negotiations, which we're saying is really tough right now. Okay, so I was showing houses. I don't work with buyers as much anymore as I used to, but occasionally I, I still do. Uh, last week, I had a referral directly uh, from someone in, in uh, the client that I sold a house. These folks were coming down from New York. All right, so like everybody else, they're leaving California, they're leaving New York, they're getting, you know, coming down here. Right, which is great for us, right? In some ways, <laughs> some people may think it's not, depending on where you're from. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so these guys are coming down, super nice young couple. Uh, you're like 40 years old. Obviously, he's he's doing really well. She's doing well. She's getting ready to finish finish graduate school. She's a little bit older, already got kids. Um, he's got a great job. He doesn't need to work at the office anymore in New York. He can live wherever he wants to. He's moving here. We're looking at properties at like 1.3 to 1.7 in North Raleigh. Guess how many properties we were able to look at? Five. Five. That's all. You know, they came down for two and a half days. And like, well, what are we? You know, we looked at a little bit of new construction, but most of your new construction in North Raleigh now is like one seven and up. You know, it's it's just getting hot. Um, so it's tough. So we looked at five properties. Out of those five, two of them were sold by the end of the weekend. So they're having to come back again. I said, well, look, guys, I said, I, I really love you to buy now. I mean, that's the you know, realtor always wants you to buy now, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's better that way. So we get it done, uh, get our check. And I know that's, you know, people say that's not how it is, but that's how it is. Okay, right. go ahead. Your negotiation is really based on the inspection report? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. yeah, so what we do, so once we get the inspection report, so in, the, in this particular instance, we didn't get a house under contract. Those people are coming back to Raleigh. Hopefully there'll be more inventory on the market at that time. They're coming back into April. We'll see. Um, there probably will be more inventory at that time. Um, so with this, when we do, we get this report, um, you know, we go through it with the buyer. I, I go through it with it after he does at the end of the inspection. And then I go through it line by line with them. You kind of find out really quickly when you're talking to the buyer how important some of these items are. If they're skipping over items and it doesn't seem like a big deal to them, I mean, that's really up to them. Now, I think you still, as an agent, you need to, you know, if you see something in here, especially safety issues and things like that, to me, those are always things that you may want to consider taking a look at. But, like, again, that being said, if they've got 10 grand in the deal, that makes it tough if they've already got 10 grand in that deal. Um, but what I try to do for in a no more normal market, okay, let's say a year and a half ago, two years ago, what I would try to do is typically come up with a list of what they want. You know, if they want everything on the list and they're, they're, that's what they've got to have and they want to have it, then that's what your job as an agent is to do 
is to write that up, okay, on the DDRA, right, and submit that to to the listing agent. Um, and you might have some kicking and screaming and this and that. Who the, who the hell is the same inspector? You know, I've never heard of them before. 75 page, 80 page report, this and that. You'll hear all that. I mean, okay, it is what it is. I submitted my, my report. Um, typically, it's a negotiation, right? That listing agent is going to go over the same thing with their guy. Their guy's going to get pissed off. He's going to say, oh my gosh, this is just ridiculous. They're asking me to tighten the screw on the receptacle or whatever, okay? <laughs> yeah, I can do all this myself. Or that's the other one. You know, the seller's like, I can do everything myself. And like, well, no, they asked, you know, that it be a licensed electrician, a licensed plumber. And so you have all sorts of fights, people going back and forth, really being childish. Okay, so what happens is you get egos involved, especially with men, right? And it, then it starts to become, you know, who's going to win, right? Who's going to win? So that's not what we don't want to get into, though. That's what we don't want to do. All right, we want to keep it as seamless as possible. And so what I try to do is go through with my people, say, do we really, need, you know, can't you live with that screw not being tightened? And then maybe we can tighten it. When, next time when we go to do our walkthrough, you know, little things, that's just an example. Um, you know, I'm kind of joking about some of that. But, you know, there are things that we don't ask for that aren't nitpicky. You know, let's look at the serious items. We've got moisture in the crawl space, okay? We've got items that are requested. Maybe we've got some mold, evidence of mold, and then maybe we need to deal with that, okay? But if it's been raining for 40 days and 40 nights, you're bound to have a little bit of moisture probably somewhere in the crawl space. Am I, am I right about that? It's going to ebb and flow, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and conditions are going to be, I'll tell you, the worst day of the year to ever look in a crawl space is, is today. 70 degree day after it's been in the 30s and 40s. If you go in these places today, it's going to be like a rainforest because everything in there was cold. Now it's warmed up. It's like fog, right? But it's not going to last. Right. Because it's a, you know, it's a temperature differential thing uh, when you think about it. But it's the long term, again, it's the long term effect. <clears throat> that's a for a day or two and then it dries out right of the temperature differential that's not a great thing. right yeah i have yeah you know just thinking back that peaking in crawl spaces with fires okay in august and july right when it's 98 degrees outside and you've got 80 percent humidity or whatever it is okay and the duct work and, and everything's driven and there's wet all over the uh uh vapor barrier and we go, oh my God, there's water all in the crawl space. You know, people are freaking out. I'm like, I'm like, hey, you know when you go grab a beer and you set it out, you pull it out of the cooler and you sit it on your, you know, outside and it's eight, and it sweats. That's what happens. You know, let's just calm down. It's okay. It's not a sealed crawl space. We got vents. Okay, it's it's gonna be hot in there. And so that stuff is gonna sweat. I mean, it's gonna happen. So I think it's just the delivery. Like, I'm not trying to say, you know, if they want to get an HVAC contractor to come look at it, if it's not functioning properly, then that's what we need to recommend. And if the home inspector recommended that in his report, that he's limited in his scope of what he can do and his scope of work, then, hey, guys, you know, the system is 15 years old, probably ought to get an HVAC company and check it out. You know, and then if it's dripping because of something that's wrong, then he, he can be responsible for telling the client that. Um, but so back to two, three years ago, I know I jump all over the place, but that's just how my brain kind of works. Um, so I apologize, but you know, what I like when I'm dealing with buyers also is if they don't care about the items getting fixed, or if they'd rather do them themselves and have them fixed the way they want to have them fixed, because you know, sometimes people are just going to do the bare minimum as a seller to get an invoice from a contractor and say it's fixed. So I just like to ask for money in lieu of repairs. Okay, and most sellers typically like that as well. Okay, you got 250,000 in our house, you know, say there's possibly, we're looking at three to $4,000 in repairs that we had the plumber talk to them about, electrician, GC, whatever it is, or maybe we got termite, that's gonna cost thousand bucks, whatever, whatever we come up with. And we request money in lieu of repairs. Okay, and so on the DDRA, which you have to be really careful, and this is, you know, I'm not trying to be shady, you got to be real careful with the lenders getting these things, right? 
difference. If you send a, a DDRA to a lender that says five thousand dollars in lieu of repairs, what do you think the <laughs> what do you think the lender? Do you think the lender is going to like that? No. Okay. So so you need to do an amendment to contract, correct? If the seller agrees, amendment to contract that says seller to pay five thousand dollars in closing costs. And then separately, you have the DDRA that says five thousand dollars in lieu of repairs. Um, the, the lender doesn't need. I mean, I've never been told that I can't do that. So I, I that's between us. We keep that. Obviously, everybody wants the deal to work. Um, in the case of as is, mm -hmm. like with what you're saying, say you know, if you say as is, yeah. I'm well, every contract in North Carolina is as is. Right, so all of our our offer to purchase is an as-is contract. Did you know that? Yeah. I did, but I had I had another agent tell me that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they signed the other the um, provision. Mm -hmm. so what they, what provision? The um, DDRA. The additional. The additional. Yeah. No, not that. You know what the house rules say that. Uh, no, not no. that one, but the other one. Additional but, provisions uh, in them. Yes. Okay. Um, as it marks that number five or whatever as is. Okay. So what happens with that now? Well, I mean, if somebody's bought, you know, the contract's already as is. So if they don't request anything during due diligence, but you can terminate the contract for any reason during due diligence, right? It changes um, on Friday. Right. The contract is just done. So, so the as is really doesn't mean anything. You can, you, you can tell somebody as is all you want. Okay. So why, what's the purpose of, of anybody submitting the extra? Document. Well, I'm not looking at if I was reading the document, I might say a little bit different, but they can still terminate the contract because you have a due diligence period. Right. right? So that due diligence, unless there's something in that addendum that I mean it's not going to override the due diligence period. You can cancel it for any reason or no reason. As this really means nothing in North Carolina. And that's what he said to me, but right. I was like, I thought it was something special. <laughs> and I'm not an attorney either, so I probably shouldn't be saying, you know, some of that's like <laughs> almost <laughs> borderline, you know, leak, but I mean it. Yeah, you have a due diligence period, you terminate for any reason or no reason. So, so as is means nothing. And I mean, yeah, you, you have agents all the time. Oh, we're buying the house as is, you know, this and that. They send in the email, like, oh, that's nice. I mean, they still come back and ask for $20,000 worth of stuff. Right. So it's just a sales, it's a way to get the house under contract. Oh, we're buying it. And as get, is. get the new agent who's listing it and just don't been working for three weeks. Like, let's give it to you. Right. Me. Oh, yeah. They're buying it as is. This is great. Now, there are, I have seen documents, like you said, that are attorney have drafted addendums that are that are saying as is, where is, but the due diligence period still overrides that. And with the due diligence period of only like a week. Yeah. I mean, if, in that case, then that's great. If you got a due diligence period of a week, then after that, make sure you get earnest money. Though. So many people don't you so many, so many people think earnest money doesn't matter. You're so wrong. Earnest money totally matters. Okay, yeah, that hard money up front matters. But say you got a three week due diligence period, which is three weeks to 30 days is pretty typical, right? What I see. Okay, three weeks to 30 days, you get 10 grand for that period, which is a ton of money. It was never intended for due diligence to, to get those amounts. Okay, for low low end properties, but that's what has happened because of the supply, <clears throat> but you also need earnest money because you know, and, and I'm saying this as a listing agent, you need earnest money. Okay. Because your buyer gets to the end of that three week or that buyer gets to the end of that three week due diligence period. Yeah. They've lost their 10 grand, but you still got two or three weeks to closing for some reason they can't close. Right. And there's zero earnest money. You don't get anything. At least if you have $1,500 or $2,000 earnest money in there, even if it's additional earnest money at that point, you know, that seller has something else they're getting for that period during that time. So seller can't, you can't really sue the, the I mean, sue somebody for anything, but the, you know, the contract that limits you to what your damages are, is really the due diligence money, which you get, and then your earnest money, if it goes beyond due diligence is what the, what the seller is limited to get. But you should talk to an attorney about that. Probably. <laughs> um, to any other questions, I know I rambled a lot. I hope it was some good information. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I just, I think the main thing right now, guys, is, is all agents. I mean, I'm dealing with the same thing. I had a really great past couple of years, and I've been doing this a long time. But we have got to figure out how to get this inventory up, uh, and that includes 
Yeah, I, for Ivan Spetters too. I mean, go ahead. I would broadcast from the top of the mountains if people were paying fifty thousand over for houses. I would hammer that home. Yeah. And, and you know, those stores are going to lose stuff in the better than anything. Right. Because when sellers start to find out, you know. Uh, you know, my house has gone up in value 12 percent over the past. And somebody's willing to throw extra money at me. Right. And the other thing is, we got to start doing is we we got to get out there. So so when you have a buyer and you find a house in the neighborhood that's for sale, and there's 20 buyers that are wanting to buy that house, if you have a buyer that you're working with that wants to buy that little house, more likely he's not going to have a really good chance of getting it. So you need to go as an agent and knock on all 40 doors around that house. And have your letter ready to go and say, hey, look, we're not even going to go look at that house because there's 40 cars in front of the driveway. We're going to go to all these other houses and talk to these guys. That's what we need to be doing things differently than what we're doing. Like, be different than everyone. If you're not different, you're never, you know what I mean? We have to differentiate ourselves from all the other agents. And that's what Keller Williams has always done a good job of, and they've been successful at it. So I think that's what we, you know. I'm not your typical kind of like high heel agent or whatever, but I, you know, but I know how to get it done. Somehow I do it. So you have to be different. And so I would recommend all of us trying to build on that. So any, any other questions? No. Go ahead. And I'm sorry, everyone already knows this, but like, how much additionally is it for an HVAC um, inspection or some of these office? The diagnostic, we've got we've got one vendor who'll do it for 99. We've got another vendor who'll do it for 125. It just it, it depends on who's, who's available. Uh, and usually that's for a first system, and then an additional system, maybe another for 50. Or you know, it's not not terrible. Uh, radon is pretty standard around 150. Uh, termite these days probably runs anywhere from 75 to 105, uh, depending on who you're using. Um, swimming pools, we charge 350 for swimming pools. Um, what else? Oh, septic um, is going to be that 350 to $400 range. Um, water testing, well and water is going to be typically there's, there's one of two tests. One is going to just test for bacteria and get a well inspection, and that's going to be around 150. Uh, no, no, that one's around 100. I think for a full panel, a well inspection with full panel water test, which adds uh, lead, nitrates, and nitrites, is going to be around 180, 190. And that test is the one that's required for FHA VA HUD, requires the, the full panel test. Uh, what else? Um, that's interesting. I mean, and also you talk about VA. Okay, that, that water test is different than just a normal bacteria test for cold or bacteria. Okay, but um, you know, VA also, uh, if you have a VA buyers, which it seems to that there's a lot more now. I mean, I'm a VA, I'm a VA buyer. There's lots. You know, there just seems like I don't know for whatever reason right now I'm seeing a lot more VA buyers. A lot of that's because they rate raise the limit up so much higher than it used to be. They used to like, okay, you veterans, you're a veteran, second class citizen, we'll keep you down here. And you know, that's as much as you can buy. But they've really raised that through, and which I think is great for our veterans. Uh, it can get them into trouble though, if they're not careful. <laughs> but you know, when when um, sometimes in a VA loan, if that appraiser, VA appraiser points something out, okay, even if you have a home inspection, right? If that VA appraiser comes out there and he sees something wrong, he will require the seller to fix those that item a lot of times, okay, in order for that buyer to close on the loan. Now, of course, the seller can refuse to do it. That just means the buyer can't get the loan. Okay, so that that can happen. So that's why if you're working with VA buyers, you have to be really cognizant of when you're walking through. If you see anything major that or that potentially could be major. It's just to keep that in mind. And I don't mean tell the VA buyer, like, hey, this is a major problem, because that's not your job. You're not just not your job to scare the buyer away from buying the house. That's not really not going to do you any good. But um, it's just something to think about. So anything else? Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Morgan, I think uh, I hope there's some popular.
population. We're going to do a walk group this afternoon. Um, I guess Mona or, or Justin or somebody's got that address. And I think that's two o'clock. I mean, there's probably a good one. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know that you're good? Yeah, I'm going to say. 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 i am going to say 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 i am going to